Hare Krishna Yogeshwar Pro. Thank you very much for joining the Monks Podcast again. For gracing us with your association wisdom. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you. My pleasure. So, if you're okay, I might just make a few notes while you're talking also. Mm -hmm. And I thought today we could discuss, based on this article you had written on ISKCON news about this devotee who asked you a letter, send you a, a letter asking questions about some of Prabhupada's statements that can seem very, very inflammatory at times, very controversial. So it's a delicate subject, but at the same time, it's an important subject. And I found you know, there are three things in the way you handled it. And we will post the link to the article in the, in the podcast also. That you know, Because it is a personal narrative, that itself brings a certain level of authenticity. You're talking from a perspective of uh, that, that. And then you also brought in sound logic. And then you brought in also your, your experience with Prabhupada also. So personal perspective means you come from one of the, one of the demographics who could potentially be offended by Prabhupada's words. And you also had personal interactions and you also use logic. So I found this th three combination, uh, it has a significant weight. So thank you for consenting to discuss on this topic. Too. It's my pleasure. Um, it's an important topic and I, uh, I thank you for having thought to, um, to bring it to the attention of your audience. Yes. So, um, how, how would you like to go ahead with it? Should I, I mean, uh, should we just go along the flow of the article which you have or you would like to start with maybe the incident where, it's, where it started off with the letter or something? Right, Let, let's let's give it a little background so that everyone uh, shares the same information, the same starting yeah. point. Yeah. Um, Srila Prabhupada's mission in, in the world now is uh, past 55 years. And... Um, over the course of these many years, we've never systematically dealt with statements in his books and lectures that can, on their surface, be inflammatory or misunderstood or, uh, or understood, and if so, uh, uh, insulting to certain people, um, uh, uh, even offensive if taken in the wrong way. There are statements that Srila Prabhupada made about... Um, women, about people of color, about uh, the role of uh, different uh, uh, groups of people. Uh, in my case, having been born Jewish, um, I've had many people approach me over the years asking for an explanation of Srila Prabhupada's statements about um, Adolf Hitler. Uh, Hitler was the founder of the National Socialist or Nazi Party, which came to office in Germany in 1933. And over the course of the next 12 years was responsible for the death of 6 million Jews through torture, starvation, uh, dehumanization, and other uh, abominable acts, so-called medical experiments without use of any anesthetic, as well as tens of millions of other people uh, during World War II. This has come to be known as the Holocaust. Hitler was a rabid anti-Semite. As far as he was concerned, Jews were not fully human. They were like bacteria who were infecting the social body and therefore needed to be destroyed. Um, Srila Prabhupada on occasion made reference to Hitler and said uh, Hitler was a gentleman or Hitler uh, was not so bad this way or not so bad that way. And uh, many people were uh, very troubled by this. So I've had occasion to uh, respond from my background as a uh, researcher in the field of Holocaust history. I've written books and done documentary films that have aired on public television. And, um, that's my career is as a Holocaust historian. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not limited to Hitler and the Jews. Uh, you know, Srila Prabhupada uh, said or wrote many things that um, are only now coming to focus. There's an effort uh, currently underway. I'm not at liberty to talk about it at great length, but uh, there is a group of senior ISKCON officials who are undertaking a publication that will specifically address Srila Prabhupada's statements about women, sexuality, uh, Hitler and the Jews, 
and so on. And that's that's admirable. That finally, it's taken a long time, but at least we're finally coming to grips with statements that, um, uh, in the extreme, can alienate alienate people from Krishna consciousness if they think, well, this society and its founder have such extreme views. Uh, though, though I don't share those values, and I don't wish to be a part of this. So those statements um, risk actually alienating people from Krishna consciousness. Instead of bringing people to Krishna consciousness, we can push them away by such uh, statements. So uh, uh, that's that's some of the background here. Yes, true. So, you know, if if you permit, I'd also like to give some background from my side. That um, two two ways. First, when I was reading Prabhupada's books, somehow. We were never trained that there could be potentially a hierarchy of authority within Prabhupada's statements also. And uh, for me, it was not so much of the, the offensive statements, but the incomprehensible statements in terms of logic or common sense that were very troubling. And so, for example, in the Lilamrut, even now there is a statement uh, where where Prabhupada says by 2000, no one will be able to live on the surface of the earth because there is so much pollution that everybody will have to live like rats underground. And I read this in 2005-2006. So I asked a senior devotee about this question. That devotee was one of my prominent guides. And he wrote back to me a very heavy mail saying that... uh, the, the, the direction you are going is very dangerous. You're doubting our counter Acharya. This will be the cause of your fall down. And he says, we should have implicit faith in, in yesterday we Parabhakti that was, we should have implicit faith in the Guru and in Krishna. And then he said that, he gave some explanation which just didn't make any sense to me. He said that now I had gone on tour to America and I saw one country, one city, which is completely covered. It's like a greenhouse. So Prabhupada's prophecy is coming true. Now, I found it a very unreasonable explanation. First of all, very judgmental and very unreasonable. And for some time, I, it was a phase of intellectual torture for me. And not so much emotional torture, but intellectual torture. And later, I came to know that uh, it was a simple explanation. Nagraj Prabhu, a BTG editor, I was corresponding with him. And he said that he went through Prabhupada's conversation. And just a couple of days before that incident, when Prabhupada spoke this, some devotee in a morning walk had told Prabhupada that had read out some dystopian meteorological or like environmental report to Prabhupada in the 1960s. And that report had said that by 2000, nobody will be able to walk on the surface of the land because there is so much pollution. And Prabhupada was simply quoting that. So he explained to me that this is, you know, Prabhupada is not quoting Shastra over here. Prabhupada is simply quoting from some other source. And you know, we are not questioning Prabhupada when he is making any statements like this. So in fact, I, for some period, I felt so enraged because this was just a flashpoint and there had been many statements like this, which could be so easily understood if you understood this point that not everything that an Acharya speaks is necessarily from a Shastric source. Because Acharya is a human being also and they, they, are, they are also living in society. They are observing. They are also they are also uh, forming understandings based on other sources. So that was one understanding which helped me quite a bit. And uh, that's that's one background which I come from. And another background is that in India also, in, in about seven, eight years ago, there was a ghastly gang rape in uh, in New Delhi. It was, all, it was all the world over. And at that time, some anti-Hindu or anti-religion campaigner put together a set of quotes of, of various Indian leaders with regressive views. And in that, he put some of Prabhupada's quotes about, uh, about this particular issue. And in India, to some extent, now I, answer, I am one of the resources for many preachers to answer questions. So I answer questions on my website, and a lot of people ask me this question. And I had to actually, to answer that question, I had to actually... Uh, you know, help people reconsider their understanding of how they understood Prabhupada. So, but that time it was very, very damaging. Fortunately, it didn't get too escalated. But I'm so grateful to, so 
he said relieved and grateful to know that this is being dealt at a serious level because at that time 2012 2013 i realized this could lead to a disaster eventually so thank you again for so i i am also very deeply concerned about this issue although i am not one of the directly affected demographics uh but i am also have to deal with the challenges that come up like you said people get alienated yes bro well um several things come to mind i uh, let me start by telling you a story yeah. i was with sri lanka prabhupada in paris 1974 75 and uh i asked him his opinion about a book that i had read just before becoming a devotee in 1969 at the time it was a best selling book called the naked ape by a paleontologist named desmond morris and professor morris took the position in this book that humans are simply sophisticated animals everything they do is basically animal behavior and um you know we even even in our uh, sophisticated way uh, it's simply uh, camouflaging uh, behavior like animals you know shaking hands is really nothing more than what apes do when they show hands to show another ape that you see i have no sticks i'm not coming to attack you uh, or we shave our underarms and then we put uh, deodorant uh, it, when the underarms are there to capture a scent that's for mating purposes anyway I thought Srila Prabhupada would say now he is a rascal and um he doesn't understand anything about uh, human nature when he heard the description of the book Prabhupada's eyes got big he said this is very good he said you should use this book in your preaching how is that Prabhupada said because we are animals without krishna consciousness without an understanding of our higher nature we are nothing but animals he is exactly he is correct and said you should use this book so i'm confirming the experience you had that uh, sometimes srila prabhupad would quote other sources as a way of um indicating you might say secondary evidence shastrik is primary but sometimes there'll be secondary evidence that he would use as a way of um uh, reinforcing a particular position so that's one thing that comes to mind mm-hmm. another thing that comes to mind is that you and I may have our particular values and points of view i'm sensitive to the fact that there are people who are we might call them literalists meaning that they their spiritual security is based on a literal reading of prabhupada's teachings they take the words on the page for what is intended and they don't have an interest in interpretation uh, on variable uh, ways of understanding they are made secure by what we might call the codified wisdom the words on the page and because for many people that literal understanding is the foundation of their spiritual life i'm reluctant i'm hesitant to impose my values my understanding on them i think when we talk about trila prabhupad building a house in which everyone can live it it means that there are many different perspectives and we have to be prepared to somehow accommodate those perspectives now that raises challenges how do you accommodate a perspective that says um women are inferior to men or that uh you know um blacks are ugly i mean there's some rather strong statements in in the books and uh or they never went to the moon that's another controversy you know there there are many statements like that that if taken on face value um some people might find it uh well it's prabhupad's words so i accept it as they are without interpretation um i think you and i share a certain uh, somewhat different perspective 
And uh, this was in my response to that person who asked me to try to help him understand Prabhupada's statements about Hitler. My experience, I, I was one of those rare, fortunate people who had a chance to know Srila Prabhupada, travel with him, spend lots of time with him. We, I was his personal secretary. I was his translator whenever we went to a French-speaking country. Uh, I was his photographer. I, sometimes I cooked for him. Um, I would do chores for him. And sometimes it was just the two of us sitting there and I got to ask him whatever I wanted to ask him. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I'm very grateful to the Supreme Lord that he's given me uh, that experience. And um, so I could ask him things. And uh, he, he knew <laughs> that people would say, well, Prabhupada says this, Prabhupada says that. He, he made fun of it to my face. He said, well, I say Prabhupada said this, Prabhupada said that. <laughs> he wanted us to exercise our discretion. He didn't want us to be blind followers. I'll give you an example. Um, I asked him one time, uh, Srila Prabhupada, what should we do if we're in a situation and uh, how to act on that situation is not described openly in your books. If we don't see a, a clear direction, when you're in this situation, this is what you should do. And they said, what do you mean? I said, well, this was in Paris, by the way. Uh, I said, we have met with a friend of George Harrison. Her name is uh, Regine. Now, Regine, <coughs> back in the 1970s, was a very well-known uh, entertainer. And she had open nightclubs. She had two or three nightclubs in Paris. And because she was a friend of George Harrison, she met us and said, you know, I want to do a, a, a gathering for you in my home. We'll call it a soiree Indienne, an Indian soiree. You know? Well, you'll bring the shot up. I'll bring, I'll bring my friends and we'll raise some money so you can build your temple here in Paris. It was a very nice offer. I said, okay, what should we do? Well, she said, come to meet me in my club tonight and we'll talk about it. Which club? New Jimmy at midnight. Now, this was on a Friday. Here's what you need to know. New Jimmy, the New Jimmy Club in, in Montmartre, Montparnasse, um, on a Friday night was when all of these rich old guys would show up in limousines with these young women on their arms wearing mini skirts. And the floor of the club was a big mirror. The whole floor was a big mirror. <laughs> so it was a little dicey, you know. And she wanted us to come at midnight on a Friday night, like at the height of all of the rock and roll or whatever. I just wasn't sure. So I asked, Prabhupada happened to have been in Paris at that time. So I said, what, you know, what should we do? And he thought for a bit, he said, all right, well, go fishing. Just don't get wet. <laughs> <laughs> and then that's when I asked him, look, there are times, Srila Prabhupada, when... Uh, we, if you're not here and we, we don't know what, what to do, how should we act? He said, well, there's two things. There is Vediki and there is Lokiki. Vediki means what it sounds like from the Vedas. It's there, it's codified, it's words on the page. You'll find your answer by referring to the texts. Lokiki means according to Loka, according to time and circumstances and place, I said, then use, use your intelligence. You have God-given intelligence. You have to be able to uh, uh, choose a path according to your best judgment. Now, one person's, this is interesting, because one person's best judgment will be different from another person's best judgment. He wasn't saying there is only one way, my way. He never said that. He said, use your intelligence. Now, for some people, that may be uncomfortable. You know, there are people, they just want, just tell me what to do. You know, my spiritual master says to do this. My spiritual master is absolute. He's always correct. That's what I'm going to do. What do you do when your spiritual master says, use your intelligence? 
then what do you do? No, so we have to be a little, a little flexible. Yes, yeah, so sorry. There's so much of what you're saying speaks to my experience that uh, what, what you earlier said, I just do a little backtrack. You said about the Prabhupada's home being big enough for people whose foundation of spiritual security comes by the literal understanding, the codified words. So I, I met one young man a few years ago and he seemed to be very happy in Krishna consciousness. I'm very happy. All my anxieties are relieved. It's really wonderful. So how did that happen? He said, now I don't have to think about anything. I just follow instructions and my life is secure. <laughs> my life is secure. <laughs> that was not funny, but it's fun. Yeah. So now, now I, I appreciate your compassion in saying that now in some ways, if, if that person is fortunate enough to get a good guide, they'll be elevated. But if they are in a situation where they don't get such a guide, they could be in trouble. But I appreciate your point that uh, some people come to Krishna for that purpose. They are just distressed. Yeah. By con con so one form of conf one form of distress, that means talk about four categories of people who come to Krishna. We say distress. We be, I, we're very, very careful, you know, to respect that. You know, we may not agree with someone, but if they're trying to serve Krishna, they deserve our obeisances and our encouragement and our support I mean, you can't just put someone down because they have a different point of view that's not our way yeah, so, so i really appreciate so major source of distress in kaliuga is directionlessness and confusion and people just feel if i just get this that's enough I, that's all i need and then if they, they see confusion in the devotee circles in the direction then that it becomes very disorienting for them so, so what you are saying, if I understood right, is that uh, that Prabhupada, while Prabhupada's house is big enough to include, should be big enough to include people from this background also. At the same time, Prabhupada was aware of the danger that might come when people would quote him, say, out of context. And that's why he said that you should use intelligence. You should use your intelligence. Yes. Now, of course, it's a good idea when using your intelligence to um, consult the Vaishnavas. Of course. Because so, it may not be your intelligence, it may be your imagination. How do you know the difference? So it's always a good idea to take counsel from the, the senior devotees. But here's the thing. my My guiding rule in my life has always been what will support Srila Prabhupada's mission? Srila Prabhupada was someone, he was in favor of everything if it brought people to Krishna consciousness. So my criterion, my, my litmus test is, will this support Srila Prabhupada's mission? Will it bring people to Krishna consciousness? So that when evaluating certain statements, I don't go on the strength of, is the literal meaning correct or is the interpretive meaning correct? I ask, what will serve Srila Prabhupada's mission? After all, that's he came here for that. What will bring people to Krishna consciousness? And sometimes, even if, even if you are a literalist and you wish to take Srila Prabhupada's words on their face, still you have an obligation to ask yourself, what is the correct thing to do? Not what is the literally accurate thing to do, but what is the correct thing to do to support Srila Prabhupada's mission? Now, why do I say that? Well, I'll give you an example. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Goswami Maharaj knew that when Europeans would come to India, they came from uh, meat-eating cultures. At one point, he, had, he issued instructions to disciples, serve them meat. When they come here, you serve them what they're accustomed to. And Srila Prabhupada, we, very often, when, when we were in Paris, we had our temple in the suburbs. This was in the early days. And we had converted the garage to the deity room. And Srila Prabhupada said, you let people come in with their shoes on. Can you imagine? Let them come in with their shoes on because the French people are not accustomed to taking their shoes off. 
Was this in the altar room or it was in the temple? Yes. Tonight? Yes. In the, in the temple room. Now he said you can put a, a rope so they don't come too close to the deities. But still, he was saying, don't force them to take their shoes off. Just let them come in. So maybe we were fanatical or, or, or fundamentalist, but he wasn't. He was very flexible. As long as it helped to bring people to Krishna consciousness. And then later on, you can get a little bit deeper or stricter or put more regulations. You know, in the beginning, uh, Prabhupada was so lenient with us, so lenient. Yamuna, when she came to 26 Second Avenue in 1968, 67, she was still smoking. Joan, it was Joan Camp, Camp, Campanella. Yeah. And Prabhupada had her cooking because there was an initiation ceremony the next day. And she said, can I smoke in the kitchen? He said, no, if you wish to smoke, just step outside. You know, the question is, what serves the mission? What will bring people to Krishna consciousness? Okay. So can I interrupt you one minute over here? I appreciate your point, And I, I fully appreciate this foundational principle that, uh, that uh, what will bring people closer to Krishna consciousness? See, with respect to ethical boundaries or even cultural boundaries, you know, there are examples of Prabhupada being very compassionate in extending them. Uh, are there examples of Prabhupada extending intellectual boundaries? That means, uh, because what uh, the question comes up over here is that uh, for many devotees, this seems to be a different category. If Prabhupada had not been culturally flexible, he would not have been able to reach out to anybody in America. If Prabhupada had not been culturally, ethically flexible, but it seems that at least the mainstream understanding in the movement is uh, Prabhupada was intellectually very rigid. And many, uh, so for example, during our, one of our previous podcasts, also you mentioned about Laukik. Hmm? Now, I have only read it in the Bhakti Rasamrut in Sindhu. Prabhupada mentions at one place about Laukik Praman, but that that is a that is something which we as devotees need to use. Uh, the only time I read it again was in your book, uh, uh, Swami in a Strange Land. And then you mentioned it. So the idea that we have to also consider this as a, as a, as a relevant source of authority, certainly not a supreme source, that is that understanding. While it's common sense, it's, uh, it's absent. So Prabhupada being intellectually accommodating where he was ready to say, change or adapt his own positions, his own state, earlier statements. So that is the category where uh, I have found a stumbling block because I find that cultural or ethical flexibility, many people don't accept that as an argument for intellectual flexibility regarding Prabhupada's statements. Well, I hope if it, I... Yeah. If by intellectual flexibility, you mean, uh, <laughs> would he be polite to people who had um, uh, different points of view? Yes, for the most part, he was always polite. Sometimes if people were being stubborn, he would be a little bit stern with them. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it, there's a difference, I think, between and a, a willingness to discuss with people in a, in a, in a uh, polite, civilized way, different points of view, and people insisting on their point of view, uh, opposed to the uh, Vaishnav Siddhanta. Prabhupada was not very intellectually accommodating with people who were um, petulant, if they were insisting on something, he would put them down. He would say, that, that's foolishness. Are you a fool? <laughs> Can he be very strong with them? And if someone was polite, I'll, I'll give you some examples. In Europe, there were many religionists. We scheduled meetings for Srila Prabhupada frequently. And if someone came from the Christian church, from there was a Franciscan monk who came, there were different people who came. And if they were sincere and humble, 
uh, whatever their path may be, if they were followers of Jesus, or Prabhupada was so respectful and so appreciative. But if someone came and was a pretender, not open-minded, but adamant, you know, you, you Hindus, you know, uh, dismissive of Krishna consciousness, then he, then he was not intellectually accommodating at all. So very often it was a matter of the character of the individual. Same is true in science. Prabhupada had nothing against science. Nothing. That's a big mistake to think that somehow we are anti-science. Big mistake. Huge. Huge mistake. I think we had a whole podcast on the topic where you explained that. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So the same is true. You know, like he, he wanted us to exercise our brains. He really, really wanted us to think about things deeply. So sometimes he would take a contrary position. He would say things like, um, there is no God. Now discuss. It doesn't mean that he believes there is no God. You know, he was pushing us to be intellectually flexible, if you will. And the same is true when he said about Hitler. So Hitler is a gentleman. Now discuss. Okay. Well, why, do you, why was he a gentleman? Well, if you read the context of the discussion, I think it took place in India. It's there in the conversations book. Um, it was within the context of how, Shri Le, uh, how Hitler never used the atomic bomb. The Americans used the atomic bomb at a time when most historians and military experts would say it really was not necessary to drop bombs, two atomic bombs on Japan. The war was over. It was not necessary to do that. The same is true, for example, the bombing of Dresden. Yes. Dresden had already surrendered. There was no reason to subject the German citizens of Dresden to horrendous uh, fire bombing. It's like just cruel. So that was not being a gentleman. So if Hitler never dropped an atomic bomb and that makes him a gentleman, well, he's challenging us to think about things. It doesn't mean that he thought Hitler was a gentleman all the time and always. Hitler liked dogs, you know, so if, if Prabhupada says Hitler was compassionate to animals, does it mean that he believed Hitler was compassionate to everyone all the time? You know, we, we take something out of context and blow it up and all of a sudden becomes absolute truth when it was never intended for that. That's true. So this is a, this is a very important point which you mentioned Prabhupada, about uh, two points. So when I was about intellectual flexibility, give beautiful examples. The point I was making about intellectual flexibility is that Prabhupada allowing a re-examination of his own statements or a recontextualization of his own statements. Uh, yeah, I said that, but it was in that context. Uh, and is there any example of that? Now, a couple I have heard at different occasions, mm, whereas Harish Auri Pro told me this, and this has not been implemented, that there is a purport in the eighth canto where there is a fight between the Devutas and the Asuras. And Prabhupada writes in the purport that the blood, it said, rose up to the sun. And that's the translation. Prabhupada says here that it said the blood rose up to the sun, not to the moon. And this shows that the sun is closer than the moon to the earth. And Harishwari Prabhu in charge was, was in charge of uh, he, he was he would take the transcript recordings and then he would send for transcription. So he told Prabhupada that Prabhupada uh, that no, I think I found a mistake in your purpose. I, I mean, Harishwari Prabhu told me this. I was shocked. I said, how could you say that? He said, you know. I had that relationship. They said, what is that? So he explained, Prabhupada, this battle is happening on the on the edge of the milk ocean where they had done the churning. This is not happening on the earth. Oh, oh. Prabhupada said, I thought it is happening on the earth. And then he said that, okay, then you have it removed. And then he had, he opened the Bhagavatam and he checked it. He said, still now it was not removed. But at least in the online Veda base, that passage has been removed. And uh, also, uh, there is a GBC resolution, which in conjunction with VBT, they have decided that in future printing of the Bhagavatam, it should be removed. So, Dravida Prabhu and Jayadit Maharaj sent me that, and Harishwari Prabhu asked for it. 
so this is of course a major example but you know when you, we say that we use our intelligence there are the two distinct things use our intelligence to deal with a particular situation that's of course required but use our intelligence to say reconsider or consider the context of the prabhupad statements that for many people uh, seems to be like a going toward a, a dangerous or offensive mentality and that is so i also know we need to be extremely cautious but i my question was that say when you gave a particular explanation of prabhupad's uh, statement about hitler and that's a perfectly reasonable explanation and uh, so the point that we should consider his statements in context and did prabhupad in his personal example give us the 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 room to do that was there any example like that in this in your interaction with him or in your knowledge of him all the time really <laughs> just once or twice all the time <laughs> Look, let me let me give you some uh, some background uh, achutananda swami in his book blazing sadhus tells a story about when he was uh, with prabhupad in the very early days at 26 mm -hmm. second avenue and um <clears throat> you think all right well if the spiritual master is absolute then he has to he's supposed to know everything so he was challenging prabhupad and said how many windows are there in the empire state building prabhupad looked at him and said how many drops of water are there in a mirage i don't remember no, that yeah yeah there's no answer to, to these questions it was uh, maybe asked by a chutananda in in a innocent way but prabhupad's point to him was don't try to uh uh impose some artificial definition of what is uh absolute only say that the spiritual master is perfect it means everything he's done is done is motivated by love motivated by love for krishna and in in the condition of love even imperfections are perfect you know in the spiritual world uh a, a, a treya rishi wrote a letter to prabhupad back in 71 i think where he saying uh 72 i can't deal with the gbc anymore he says it, it, there's so much arguing and it's all very imperfect and everyone makes mistakes in their judgments and prabhupad said that that's because we're human he wrote him back in a letter says we're all human therefore we make mistakes he said the difference is mistakes in connection with krishna are all glorious he says in the spiritual world sometimes krishna gets so distracted by uh radharani becomes so distracted by krishna she puts her sari on upside down and krishna gets so distracted looking at radharani trust to milk a bull yeah, <laughs> you know mistakes are also glorious when they're in connection with krishna So perfection isn't some artificial idea that you know the spiritual master knows how many hairs there are in your head or no well, he, he knows everything meaning he knows everything to help you become krishna conscious. So you know in in assessing definitions of of absolute perfect you know infallible we, we, we you don't drag your material conception of these words into the spiritual realm it, is, it means something different in connection to krishna consciousness so in terms wow. of you you are you are expert at flipping the paradigm you know sometimes some some devotees may say or some people may say that if we are questioning or contextualizing prabhupada statements that is dragging our material conceptions on shri prabhupad well that could be a danger but the same danger can come in the other way also that we are dragging our material conceptions of how an acharya should be or we would like an acharya to be omniscient don't do that hmm. don't, don't don't try to judge someone on the spiritual platform platform by your material standards There's that verse in Chaitanya Charitamrita. If you see Nityananda Prabhu going into a liquor store, don't don't condemn him. Don't judge him. You can't you can't tell the the behavior of a pure devotee. You you can't judge that. And if you try, if if your standards are so strict, 
you know, you're going to get into trouble because as soon as there's a, con a, a conflict and you don't understand it, then you'll go away. That's what happened when people tried to apply such material standards. Prabhupada said, we never went to the moon. And then they bloop. They, they leave Krishna consciousness because they're judging Prabhupada's statements by their material standards. You, how do you do that? Going to the moon means being able to go there and stay there. Yeah. You know, there, there, are, there are interviews that Prabhupada had with uh, reporters. I've read this very carefully. He leaves it quite open-ended. You know, he, he, does, he says, even if they went to the moon, <laughs> they couldn't stay there because it's not a, an earth environment. You know, you don't have the proper body for living on the moon. So it wasn't that he was making some kind of absolute judgment that, uh, anyway, the point is, yeah. you know, if you get hung up with these um, things uh, too, uh, too, too much, you can get into a lot of trouble about it. And you know, Prabhupada, I can, I can reassure you from my own experience, he was a warm, wonderful, um, transcendental human being <laughs> you know, who, who um, in this lifetime went through experiences. And so he was very sensitive and compassionate to people, knew from his own experience uh, what marriage was like, what it meant to be a father, what it meant to work in a business. He had all those experiences in his lifetime. You know, he, he would always ask me when I came to see him, he said, how's your wife? I said, no, she's fine. He said, good, uh, don't fight. He said, she said, he said, husband and wife should love each other. Otherwise the relationship becomes dry. Now you don't hear that. Not at sure all. Was, <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> <laughs> All that you hear is don't be attached to each other. Oh, women, the left breast is anger and the right breast, you know, <laughs> these crazy things. <laughs> and here's here's my my Prabhupada, you know, the Prabhupada I have in my heart, who is this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful person who um above everything else was compassionate to people, understood, you know, everyone comes from, this is a material world after all. Nobody has a happy story to tell. So can you not be compassionate enough with someone to reach out a hand of, of love and, and, and uh, support to them? Whatever your beliefs may be about the role of women or this or that, how will you make any progress if you think you are better than anybody? Oh, this is beautiful. So now you are uh, taking that ultimately, whatever be the, you could say the intellectual authority of Prabhupada's statements, you can take it from a different perspective that is taking those statements the way we are taking them, uh, going to help us grow spiritually. So it's not just help Prabhupada's mission grow, but also help us grow. So if you use those statements to become, say, if that makes us less uh, less compassionate because makes us heartless to the pain of others. Yes. Then oh, we are now you have it. Now you have it. You never remember that story in the Krishna book when Krishna was pretending to have a headache and he says, only the dust from the feet of my devotees will cure my headache. So his messenger goes to the Shastric Brahmins, you know, and they say, uh, oh, we cannot do, put our the dust of our feet on Krishna's head will go to hell. The gopis immediately give the dust. You know, aren't you afraid to go to hell? Well, good. So we'll go to hell. I don't care. Take it. And the, the, the Brahmins realize our knowledge is, is condemned. It's useless because we don't have the love that uh, our, our wives have for Krishna. So your knowledge, you may be able to quote a thousand Sanskrit verses. Your knowledge is condemned. It's hellish. If you have not developed compassion and love for all of God's parts and parcels, your knowledge is a, is a stumbling block on your spiritual path. To hell with your knowledge. Don't quote verses to me. Show me how big your heart is. Yeah. 
Beautiful. So you are applying the principle of the gopis and the brahman patnis and their love for Krishna. You are expanding it to all living beings in relationship with Krishna also. That love for Krishna is not exclusive; it is inclusive. And uh, so, if I, I love this point that you know, maybe how many verses we quote will show how big our heart is, our head is. But it is how we act. It is. <laughs> But how we act will actually show how big our heart is. That's a profound point. So now, are you? If I just understand, let me understand your point clearly. So you are saying that if someone is encountering a statement of Prabhupada that as that has hurt them, then it is our compassion to help them, to help them, to help heal them from their wound. And to help them refocus on developing their relationship with Krishna. So, and if we if we insist on the absolute authority of those statements which they find hurtful, then we are actually being uncompassionate. Is that the point you are making in this? Sure. You know, you if your goal is to prove a point of view, I will. I am insistent on this point of view. This is the way it is. Well. Good, good luck to you, uh, and I wish you all success. I think of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu who went to see the Mayavadis and sat down where their shoes were. <laughs> he sat in the, in, the, in the most filthy place, most humble place where they kept their shoes. And immediately won them over just by his humility. Didn't he, he didn't have to say anything philosophically. Just, he, you know, he was so humble that they were all attracted to him. Look, I I don't know. Maybe I, I don't think I'm overly sentimental. I think this is a defensible point of view that, um, you know, the rules and regulations are there to guide us. But ultimately, you reach a point where you go past the literalism of Krishna consciousness, you go to the heart of Krishna consciousness. You know, the verse in Bhagavad Gita where Krishna tells Arjuna, Arjuna is quoting, you know, the Shastras say, you know, we have to do this and we, I cannot fight because it will cause distress And this. <laughs> Krishna says, yeah, when your intelligence has passed out of the forest of ignorance, you'll become indifferent to all that. Wow, Prabhu, you are helping me see things that I have never seen in those light. So that verse, moha kalilam tarishati, Krishna says that the moha, the illusion is caused by the Vedas. So that itself is radical that the Vedas can cause illusion. But now you are extending it further to say that sometimes even, even Prabhupada's statements can cause illusion for us. So well, if you're too literal about them, and if you don't understand the spirit, if you if you don't go deeper into a, an understanding of the context, you know, context, context, context. Never forget the context. You can't understand Bhagavad Gita if you forget the context of two armies on a battlefield. You, you'll you'll lose the understanding of what's being said. Prabhupada's statements didn't take place in a vacuum. That's why it's so dangerous to say Prabhupada said this, Prabhupada said, Prabhupada said this when, where, to whom, with what intended effect, under what circumstances, why was it said at that time? You know, context is everything. Even the changing of a comma is everything. The teacher said the student is a fool. The teacher, comma, said the student, comma, is a fool. <laughs> yeah. Exactly the, one comma, yeah. exactly the opposite meaning. So don't don't tell me Prabhupada said this, Prabhupada said that. Give me the context. So now when we talk about going beyond literalism. So at one level, we could say that those who want a literal understanding, they can also be in the movement. But if we are, if our movement is actually going to expand, at least as far as the face of our movement is there, those who are going to present its teachings, 
so they they do need to have a broader understanding otherwise we will make it far more difficult than is necessary for people to come to krishna well i'm going i'm going to make it a little more even real than that if you don't mind just bear with me a minute i'll i want to tell you something it's a little difficult to talk about but i think it's relevant to this discussion i mentioned to you before we started that uh, i lost my mother a few months ago she was 95 and she was ready to go you know she said to me per intent she said straight out she said i'm tired of just trying to repair this broken machine all the time so she was she was ready to go um after she left i i had not experienced such pain such agony of um loss ever in my life i i have to tell you honestly even shrila prabhupad's passing didn't hit me so hard because i didn't grow up with shrila prabhupad my mom was a single parent i was her only child we lived in a very small apartment so she was young when she had me so we were like best friends my whole life and uh so losing her was very very difficult for me when uh after she left uh i went down to the basement of her building and she had a storage area and there i found an old box prabhu hundreds of letters it was every correspondence she and i had had since i was 5 years old she kept everything every letter including all the letters i sent her when i first moved into the temple and became a devotee hundreds and hundreds of letters so i've had i've been organizing all these letters i'm having a chance to relive my life through my mother's collection of all of our postcards and letters everything and i'm getting a sense of myself getting a clear picture of a young boy who was had a sad childhood my mother and father were divorced i was less than 2 years old she remarried briefly when i was maybe 5 and that also did not last more than a year so it's like i lost a father twice really and uh, i grew up feeling very protective of her that you know she doesn't have a husband so i have to be the man of the family so to speak and that's an unfair burden on any child so there are things about myself that i'm learning from this losing my mother so why am i bothering bother telling you all this it's because i think sometimes we posture ourselves as vaishnavas and we forget to be warm-blooded human beings we're complicated creatures our attitudes our values our perspectives the way we process information the way we interpret prabhupad's teachings it's all autobiographical if you grew up with an abusive childhood where your father was beating you or where you were abused by your family members you'll have a very different kind of relationship with authority than if you grew up in a family where you were respected where the parents were very good role models very very different interpretation of authority same is true for sexuality if the partnership that you had as your model was a, a healthy one you'll have one perspective on partnering and relationships with someone on the other hand if it was very awkward or uh, uh sad you'll have a different idea of relationships and the way we interpret things is very much uh colored by our personal history and i noted for myself for example that when i moved into a temple i was 19 years old and i think in some respects reading all of these hundreds of letters i moved into a temple at age 19 dropping out of college not because i had some deep philosophical understanding of uh, you know the vaikuntha planets and the vedanta conclusions and krishna the supreme personality i didn't know any of that stuff i moved into a temple because i saw a ready made family i had no brothers or sisters he was young boys and girls my age 
you know, living a, a, an exciting life. He was Prabhupada, a father who would not go away like the other fathers I had had in my life went away. So on one level, a psychological level, you might say, a psychic level, I came to Krishna consciousness not through a positive attraction to philosophy, but from a negative response to a problematic life that I'd had when I was younger. Now, I meet with a lot of young people today. Many of them are children of Indian families. And in confidence, they reveal to me that they're having a terrible time trying to reconcile their life as devotees. They say, I was born into this. I didn't ask for it. So I, I have my friends. I have my school. I have my buddies. I, didn't want to, I can't bring them to the temple. What are they going to see? A big pile of shoes and, and who knows what. And they, they, they can't put it together. I'm having a very, very hard time with it. And um, my parents are always putting me down because I'm not chanting 16 rounds. Very difficult situation that they're living through. It has absolutely nothing to do with the proper interpretation of Shastric verses or Prabhupada statements about going to the moon or any of that stuff. The real difficulties, the real challenges progressing in Krishna consciousness are not these issues. They're issues of us not really understanding ourselves well enough to know what are the obstacles impeding us from making solid spiritual progress. So while I appreciate this conversation very much, you know, what do we do about Prabhupada statements, about Hitler, about women, about sexuality? These are very important statements and, and important uh, issues, rather, to discuss. The background behind those issues is not about Prabhupada. It's about us. How is it that one person interprets Prabhupada's statements literally? This is it. He's the authority. Take this. That's it. Words on the page. That's all you need to know. And somebody else says, no, wait, wait. There, there's another way of approaching this. How is it there are different points of view? If the teachings are absolute, shouldn't everybody be able to accept them on the same level? But we don't. Why not? Because each of us is an individual with our own personal history, our own childhood, our own experience with parents, our own experience with family, our own experience growing up, perhaps financial poverty, perhaps some physical difficulty, some health challenges, legal challenges. Every one of us is an individual. And our relationship with Krishna consciousness is predicated not on whether Prabhupada's statement about sexuality is this way or that way. It's on what's in your heart. What is the real issue that's standing between you and reawakening your love for God? Oh. Oh. Humble and honored that you shared such a personal experience today. Thank you for that. And uh, it's such an important point that uh, that actually how we seek everything in Krishna consciousness is, is affected by our, our upbringing. Now, recently, I have in, the, in this lockdown at least, I have tried to reconnect with my father. And uh, I'm not rather they're traveling nine months a year in different parts of the world. So I'm realizing that there is so much. I used to earlier think that, you know, okay, that is a material relationship. If he becomes a devotee, it is good. If he doesn't, then I'm just having mundane talks. But actually, by talking with him, not only I'm, as you said, we are warm-blooded people who need relationships, but also I'm understanding so much about myself when he speaks about himself. Because the way he raised me, as I, I also was touched by an earlier statement that you know, this is the material world. Nobody has a happy story. So it's true for everyone. And uh, so, so this whole point of... We using certain we might sometimes be using certain statements of Prabhupada to actually run away from confronting the issues that keep us going from going to oh, now, now you're saying something. Now you're saying something. Thank you for that. 
Thank you. And also, not only do we avoid confronting, avoid avoid going towards Krishna, but when we emphasize on those issues, we actually end up creating obstacles for others also to for moving towards Krishna and confronting the real issues. I'll even go farther. Thank you. You've said the right thing. I'd even go farther and say that. We, we grow up and when we're young, we have experiences that um, we're not able to process. A child going through trauma doesn't have the intellectual or emotional tools for processing trauma. So the body and the brain know to suppress those dangerous emotions because the, the mind is, you know, the work of the mind and the tool of the mind is the brain is to protect life, yeah? So if there's something, not just if a car's coming at you, but if an emotion is coming at you, the work of the mind through the brain is to protect you. And sometimes it's by shutting down. I won't, I'm not gonna deal with that. We're not gonna deal with that. It's too dangerous. But they don't disappear, they don't evaporate. Those emotions get suppressed and they live within the cells of the body. So you're carrying around those issues from early life and you may not be consciously aware of them because they can be repressed and suppressed very deeply but there are triggers there are things that uh let me give you an example like let's say you're as a boy you went to a funeral a cremation or a burial and it was someone you love very much and uh, somebody comes up your your uncle comes up and grabs you on the shoulder and says, how are you doing? Maybe from that day on for the rest of your life, whenever somebody touches you on the shoulder, you think about death. And you don't even remember why. There are triggers like that that can revive those feelings. And I've seen in my career as a devotee now, I've been in Krishna consciousness more than 50 years, more than a half century. I've known many, many people, sincere people, but they had these triggers in them. They had these unresolved issues and things would occur in temple life that uh, clearly they were responding to something much deeper than whatever the issue was that we were discussing. It was very, very clear. So uh, I would just ask your viewers, <laughs> your listeners, people who may be hearing this conversation, to um, take a deep breath and step back away from their situation and remember a few things. Remember that um, Krishna consciousness is such an amazing, amazing uh, blessing. We are being given a lens a spiritual lens through which to view all of the experiences of our life. We can filter our entire lifetime through that lens and understand it as stepping stones toward reawakening of our love for Krishna. And if we do that, if we, if we allow room to recall very difficult, very painful experiences, it just may be that that is the reward for your chanting. Hear me out on this now. What is the proof that you have been chanting nicely? It's not that all of a sudden Radha and Krishna are going to come before you and start dancing. That Don't, don't wait for that to happen. It may be that your sincere effort at chanting the holy names will be rewarded by some insight into your own nature that will give you this moment, ah, I, I understand now, I'm, I've been responding to something from the past. I need to step back and open my horizons broader and stop being so fearful for myself. Maybe that's the reward that you will get for chanting sincerely. Profound. So this is amazing. I've seen two radically different approaches to looking at one's past. 
and in fact i grew up with the first approach that is now our past life is just like maya and forget it now you have come to krishna so it's like a dream after you wake up from a dream whether it is a bad dream or a good dream it just doesn't matter now you have come well, to reality the those letters that my mother kept all of my letters to her starting in uh, 1969 when i moved into the temple it was party line party line we're not our bodies in this lifetime you're my mother but we are eternal souls uh, you know it's like do 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 that's maya that's my it was all propaganda it may have had some reality but it wasn't very realized knowledge and it was very hurtful to her someone who had given her life to trying to raise me properly it was a big mistake i regret that and now looking back i can see that she she was very polite she handled it really well you know i asked her one time i said did i ever did i hurt you by joining a temple she said no nah, i figured you'd come around some day <laughs> yeah in our bhaktivino takur uh in his bhagavat uh talks about himself when he was younger and he didn't like the vaishnavas at all if they were just sentimentalists you know until he finally read bhagavatam the life of mahaprabhu and he realized what it meant to be vaishnava he said ah oh, it's so hard to overcome the prejudices of our youth <laughs> it's like that for all of us so bro agar you are flipping the script that there he's saying that the prejudices of his youth stopped him from understanding uh, vaishnavism in his youth but you are saying that it could be for us the the impressions from our youth may actually affect our understanding of krishna consciousness now so <laughs> why why do, you, why do you think someone would actually believe that women are less intelligent than men i mean what <laughs> what what would compel someone to actually believe that is it shastrik is that is that really what it's based on or is it something that comes from some other influences what would possibly compel someone to actually believe prabhupad thought hitler was a good person a gentleman is it really because prabhupad said it so many times that it was indisputable or is there something else going on in terms of needing to believe in the absoluteness of the guru's teachings i mean come on let's get real here beautiful you know i was reading a book recently about uh, about say how people learn so when people read a book what they remember from a book tells not so much about the book as it tells about the reader also there you go so okay so there are now if i understand the uh, three different things which we have brought up till now a lot of things but just to bring it all back to our topic you know one is that uh, certain statements of prabhupad can be very hurtful for people and we need to take responsibility to understand and present them properly that is the first statement first point which broadly and we discuss a lot of things in relation with that second point you made is that you know prabhupad was a prabhupad was a living person who who loved everyone and as you know he never wanted to speak any statement that were hurtful in the sense that if he was loving for everyone so he was not prejudiced and third you broadly made the point that you know, if we are harping on prabhu some of prabhupad if we are we are taking some of prabhupad statements very seriously are insisting on a particular reading of some of prabhupa statements that is because of us not because of prabhupa so i think it's a very comprehensive structure that has been built so when so if we actually assimilate the compassionate mood of prabhupa then we will form the right bridge between say people who are hurting because of certain statements of prabhupa and we will as you said the criteria is the main uh, principle is how can we further prabhupad's mission so we will help them understand prabhupad's statements in such a way that it clears their path to krishna so very nicely summarized yes i agree with that 
Yes, true. So, uh, two more. Uh, how much time had you planned? Because you know, I have a few things to raise on this, and it's been a very deep and fulfilling discussion. And well, if you have, if you have a couple more questions, we can okay, yes. Okay. So now going to uh, going back to that point of what we read or what we highlight tells about throws a light on us. Uh, isn't uh, uh, that at one level natural as an individual? So where it becomes a danger is when we don't attribute it to our individuality, but we attribute it to the authority. That rather than I find these statements of Prabhupada inspiring or important, and I said this is what Prabhupada is. So that is where it becomes a problem, because how can we ultimately give up our our past history? We will see through that. So the, probably the only thing we can do is just become aware of our filters. Is well, that it only becomes a problem if you insist on forcing your point of view on somebody else against their will. You know, it's a big world out there. I mean, think of when Krishna entered the wrestling, Kamsa's wrestling arena. Every person in that arena, in the audience, saw Krishna in his or her own very personal way. If there was 10,000 people, it was 10,000 different ways of seeing Krishna. You know, this one saw him as a beautiful young boy. This one saw him as the supreme personality. This one saw him as a great wrestler. Everyone had a particular pr perspective. And the, the kingdom of God is broad enough that it can accommodate unlimited different perspectives. The guiding principle is Vaishnav behavior. You know, we're respectful of others. Of course, we cannot allow harm to be done. That, that, that we cannot allow. But if someone, I was just reading in Chechana uh, Charatamrita where uh, uh, Morari Gupta was praising Lord Ram. And, you know, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had tried to convince him to convert to Radha Krishna worship. And <laughs> Morari Gupta said, what can I do? I love Ram Chandra. So Mahaprabhu wrote on his forehead, Ram Das. <laughs> he said, you are the true devotee of Ram Chandra. Yeah. So he, he didn't put him down. Oh, well, you haven't understood the higher. The highest thing is Radha Krishna. <laughs> you know? He didn't do that. He's so appreciated that you have your way of, of worshiping the Supreme Lord. Uh, I'm so inspired by you. Bhaktivinoda Thakur write, writes, when I go into someone else's church, I see how my God is being worshipped by these people in their own way, and that inspires me. He didn't put them down. Oh, they don't understand Vaishnav Siddhanta. He said, no, they're worshiping God, and that inspires me. But what's our problem? You know, that we have to be so fanatical that everyone has to think the way we do? <laughs> what kind now, of world? Here the, yeah, here the problem comes that we don't think this is the way I think. We think this is, this is what Shastra teaches. I'm not giving my opinion. I'm giving scriptural teaching. But it is scriptural teaching as understood through my individual perspective. So well, then best of luck to you. I wish you well. Okay, that's true. And uh, so just a uh, couple of more things. It's when I mentioned there's two ways of looking at our past, that is seeing that it's a dream from which we wake up, or it's, it's like I just said, a progressive thing, which has affected us. So, and it is continuing to affect us in some ways. So you made this remarkable point that sometimes better understanding our past so that we can understand where we are right now and how we have come to Krishna, that may be the reward of our chanting. So this is again uh, quite a radical understanding. So it's not that a chanting uh, may lead to say, ecstatic love for Krishna, but may also lead to a deeper self-understanding. And that self-understanding will help us to overcome or at least notice our, our, our prejudices or our impressions that are biasing us in a particular way. And if, just to extend this further, so if someone is still insisting on their perspective as the scriptural teaching, then 
could we say that uh, they haven't yet got that insight as a reward of their chanting or whatever else? No, I don't think you can make that kind of a broad statement. Their understanding may be very, very wonderful. Okay. Look, you know, here's the thing. Um, physician, heal thyself. You know this saying? Yes. <laughs> you know, we, we have our point of view. I think if there's any hope for the world, Chaitanya Charan Prabhu, it's not, it's not going to come from anyone insisting this is the way. It's by coming to the mature position of saying, I have my covenant with God, uh, and I'm secure in that. Let me now step outside my own certitude of my perspective long enough to be able to listen with open ears to what other people have to say who have their covenant with God as well. You know, the goal of Krishna consciousness is not to get everybody to dress in dhotis and saris and, and, and chant on Japa beats. That, that's not our purpose in this world. Our purpose is to move forward a, 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 a vision of divinity that uh, provides for every man, woman, and child and, and, and non-human form of life an opportunity to progress spiritually. And that comes by being able to instill inspiration in others. And I think if we can just relinquish you know, some of our, our, our uh, very uh, tenacious grip on this idea that, no, success looks like this, <laughs> not like that. You know, and we, we come to uh, this broader perspective. Um, maybe then there's, there's hope for the world. Um, that's going to take some, some growing up. We have some growing up we have to do, and we have to do it really quickly now. Um, things are things are at a you know a, a, a critical turning point in the world on so many levels, and there's need for mature, self-aware uh, men and women of good character to move forward with the agenda of Srila Prabhupada's mission. I hope that your viewers, listeners will take seriously this call. We are compelled by our participation in Krishna consciousness to calm down, take a more dispassionate look at our own behavior, our own uh, attitude and relationships with others, and ask some Difficult questions, challenging questions. There's a say, I, I like what Carl Jung, psychologist Carl Jung once said. He said, what if the worst of all offenders, those who are in most need of compassion and help, turn out to be me? Turn out that that is what is within me. What do I do then? My God, you never think like that at all, really. We talk about humility as an important virtue, but this perspective of humility as confronting our own issues, confronting our own conceptions, it is such a vital conception. Now, I just reflect what you said. This, uh, this has been till most of the times in my Krishna consciousness also, uh, what I observed, although I was never really a pushy person telling people chant more rounds or do something like that, but that was the definition of success for people. So quite often it is, you know, we look at outreach as what people are not doing and what people should be doing. But now, as I, in the last four or five years, I started, I was traveling extensively. And in the last one year, I had some time to reflect on my experiences in traveling. And what struck me is that not just looking at what people should be doing is while interacting with people, we need to look at what God is doing in their lives. It is wherever they are, God has not abandoned them. And it's not just theory. 
whatever events they have gone through so if we actually understand where god has brought them till now in their lives when they come to interact with us then as you said we can instill inspiration and take them forward otherwise if we go with a preconceived agenda okay this is what i want to tell people to do then right. we may actually not be able to we may not only not help them advance we may actually become a cause of their regression well we in inadvertently we may actually alienate people from krishna consciousness by taking an adamant point of view you may be right but you have failed miserably to understand the true purpose of shri the prabhupad's mission beautiful so right in terms of say logically arguing based on prabhupad's or making an argument based on prabhupad's statements but will we be fulfilling no, prabhupad's purpose that's right you want to be correct be correct and 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 god bless you i really don't care for your association <laughs> give me the association of pure hearted souls who understand that everyone is a better devotee than they are prabhupad once said uh, you know uh, thousands of stars cannot light up the sky one moon can light up the sky the night sky let me give me one disciple one moon like disciple i will sit with him under a tree and teach him all of krishna consciousness we're looking for that pure hearted devotee who is humble like a blade of grass more tolerant than the tree giving all respect to others without expecting any for oneself now you can chant the holy names beautiful guru thank you so can i try to summarize in a few minutes if you don't mind or you would like to add i think we made a big journey from specific prabhupad statements to a broad many broad important issues shall i try to summarize prabhu or you would like to add something including no no i please yes so we discussed today about uh, understanding some of the prabhupad's difficult statements say for example the prabhupad statement about uh, that hitler was a gentleman so you started by talking about how <clears throat> we after many years have actually as a movement started uh, taking serious account of some of those statements which may alienate offend insult people and how to how we can deal with them at a personal level say you talked about prabhupad statement about hitler this in a context prabhupad the specific context was hitler the gentleman was that he didn't use weapons of mass destruction whereas others america and america bombing japan or uk bombing brazil they did so it is in that limited context and he said face on your personal association with prabhupad where you got to be alone with him asking him any kind of questions so you understood him in a very close way and regarding prabhupad's uh, how prabhupad surprised our conceptions you talked about that book called naked ape how prabhupad said you can use this in your outreach i normally would think this is just a mundane book by a scientist proposing a theory that prabhupad contests but uh, prabhupad was very resource prabhupad was prabhupad was very resourceful and, and compassionate and then so pro- context is critical and uh, prabhu we you flipped the script several times one way was that when we insist on a liter- literal reading of prabhupad statements yes prabhupad's house are, uh, house is big enough to include literalists also and people uh, they can, they can be secure in that understanding but over a period of time we need to mature and understand that prabhupad also wanted us to use our intelligence and you talked about how when you have, you had to go to a night club to meet three uh, meet prabhupad said go there fish but don't get wet so that is specifically a question about you know what to do when we don't have directions directly in your books what in dealing with the situation and there is the shastra praman and the vedic praman and the loka praman and loka praman is based on one's uh, is based on one's judgment one's intelligence and prabhupada didn't insist that it has to be uh, our that there will be only one judgment which will be absolute in that context so different people can use their best intelligence and act accordingly in that connection he says if those who insist on the literal understanding it is they may be imposing a material conception of perfection of how an acharya should be 
Prabhupada didn't claim to be omniscient. He talked about how, how many windows are there in Empire State Building, how many, how many atoms are there in a drop of, how many drops of water are there in a mirage. So Prabhupada debunked that. And he also made this very striking point that Prabhupada was aware that devotees would say Prabhupada, Prabhupada says, and he would be quoted out of context and he wanted us to use our intelligence. So that was one category elaborately discussed about how Prabhupada himself was a very, uh, his purpose was to bring people to Krishna. And we need to, we need to consider all of Prabhupada's statements based on whether they are going to fulfill further that purpose or not. And then that brings us to the second point that if we are truly compassionate, then we won't be insisting that this is the right thing, but we'll be considering what is right for the audience to come closer to Krishna. Now, people are in pain and they need Krishna. So just as the gopis were, were, in, were in pain to hear about Krishna in pain, we should also be in pain to see those who, the, all of Krishna's parts in pain and try to relieve their pain. And if their pain is caused by some statements of Srila Prabhupada, then we need to be mature enough to give the understanding that can help them relieve that pain. And uh, if we don't do that, we will alienate many people. And uh, then you talked about if we are insisting on particular understandings of Prabhupada, that's, that's primary, that could be because of our own baggage, you could say, from we bring from the past. And you shared your personal story and about how, you know, now psychological, the reason you joined the temple was not necessarily philosophical, but also psychological. And so we need to, so in fact, that self-understanding of how our past brought us to the level of uh, coming to Krishna, that self-understanding could be a gift of our chanting also. And with that self-understanding, we will, we may not necessarily, we will always be individuals, but we will stop insisting that our individual perspective is the scriptural truth. And toward the conclusion, you said that the world, if the world is going to improve, it's not by anybody saying that this is the, I have the truth and you accept it. Rather, it is by we, we being secure in our covenant, but with God, uh, but also stepping out of that certitude to understand how, how people are acting in their particular covenant with God. And the world uh, very, very urgently needs such mature self uh, where individuals who are ready to say, maybe confront the issues in their heart. The issue is not what is the right statement, what is the right understanding of Prabhupada's statements, but the issue is, you know, what is stopping me? What are the issues in my heart stopping me from moving toward Krishna? And how I can address them? And how, what, are, what is it that is stopping others from moving to Krishna? And how we can address that? So Prabhu, it's, I feel that, the, to conclude, I said that you shifted you started with the analytical perspective, which is logical, but from that you expanded it to a very compassionate perspective for becoming for us to become vehicles of Prabhupada's compassion. So thank you very much for your time and your wisdom. Any concluding remarks, Prabhu? Yeah. Uh, my favorite part of our discussions, I always look forward to your summaries at the end because you do such a beautiful job of distilling down so many things. <laughs> <laughs> we talked about more than an hour and a half and you bring it all down just to one or two minutes of summary. It's wonderful. I'm just so amazed at how you are able to do that. So much, Krishna Dwasi, but I'm very grateful for your association also, bro. And Thank I look you. forward to having you again in future sometime. It's been very uplifting. I'm sure the reviewers will also be uplifted by that. Thank you, bro. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.